All right, welcome everybody to this session. My name is Michael Carbon. And I'm Alkis Polizotis. And today we're going to talk to you about methods for evaluating your Gen AI application quality. Now, our agenda for today is we're going to talk about a few things. One, iterating on quality, and particularly how we think about iterating on quality, and how we recommend customers think about iterating on quality. Then, how we actually go about defining and measuring the quality of Gen AI apps. And then, following that, we're going to get into an overall understanding of how you do this with our newly released product, Mosaic AI Agent Evaluation. Now, when we're talking about iterating Gen AI app quality, if you were paying attention earlier today uh, to the keynotes, Ali actually said about 80% of Gen AI, Gen AI use cases are in POC stage, right? And a lot of the challenge is how do you go from that POC, that first initial concept, to something that's actually in production? And this graph here actually illustrates what we tend to see where customers, they build that POC, and the point of that POC is just demonstrate some sort of viability of the idea, the fact that they might, with some, with some promise, be able to apply Gen AI for this particular use case. Then at that point, they oftentimes find that the quality isn't quite there to go to production, so they do this process, of pulling on the levers that are available to them in terms of using larger models, better models, better algorithms, to actually try to boost the overall quality of that system. At some point, they're successful, they get to something like a release candidate, but oftentimes what they find is that they've deployed these large models and techniques in a way such that it's still quite an expensive proposition to get that in production, and at that point, there's another step where they may consider ways to then reduce the cost, increase the performance of the overall solution by, for example, using fine-tuning to build small, fast models for the usage case specifically at hand. Now, the reason why this is so challenging is if you take a look at the compound AI systems framework and really instantiate it in a pattern like what we see with RAG, is that RAG oftentimes has this flavor of being simple, right? Where a user query comes in, we've got this enterprise data, our data that has been um, mapped over with a vector index, and our RAG chain is gonna retrieve based on that query to find relevant documentation, and then go ahead and then use that information to produce a response. And this does seem like an interesting and simple pattern, but in practice, it's significantly more challenging than this. If you've watched some of the RAG talks today, you've probably seen a slide like this, where that enterprise data, in practice, what actually happens is there's several stages going from that raw, unprocessed data to something that fits appropriately inside of your vector search and actually works well with the overall application at hand. Then the RAG chain itself, there are very many steps, or several steps that can happen transforming that initial user query to then be able to actually retrieve the appropriate documents and then combining those documents with the user query, the current chat context, if this is a multi-turn type agent that you have, to then be able to deliver uh, an, a high quality response. So, every single box here is a design choice. There's an algorithm, there's a model, there's an approach, there are parameters, all that can be used. And so when you get this space, this is why this becomes such a challenging problem and why it's so hard to go from that POC all the way up to production. Now, the way that we recommend customers think about this and what we've implemented in our Mosaic AI agent evaluation approach is what we call evaluation-driven development. The basic idea here is that you gather your requirements, of course, first build that POC as we've been talking about, but then key components then become defining and measuring quality, like what does quality actually mean and how do you measure it, right? And then from that alone, you can start to think about how do you go and do this improvement? And beneath all of this is the evaluation set, right? And this is a key critical component. Both is how we think about it in agent evaluation, but broadly, when we think about the overall architecture of what you need to build these systems, you need metrics and you need a data set on which you can measure those particular metrics for quality. So over the course of this talk, between I and Alkis, we're gonna talk about a few of these components. And the first one I wanna talk about here is this evaluation set. So this evaluation set, again, this is the foundation. It's defining the expected system inputs and outputs, and this is what you want to collect and curate in this first step of building an evaluation set. And ideally, this should be representative, reflect the variety of requests that could be seen in production. It should be ambitious, it should be challenging, it should actually stretch the systems towards capabilities that are perhaps at the periphery of what you want. Still relevant, but the periphery of what you want by, for example, including malformed or adversarial inputs where you might see truncation, right, or you may actually see a user who's attempting to solicit a prompt, prompt injection, or solicit unsafe outputs from your particular system. These should all be incorporated into your evaluation set as you're building it. Should also be continually updated. And what we mean by that is it needs to reflect the changing nature. Once your app is in production, 
the set of uses, the set of requests is going to see is naturally going to vary. And it's going to change as the behaviors of your users change as well. And as well, it needs to be continually updated to reflect, which is typically the case, the changing dynamics or the changing requirements we have of our application. Now, as an example here of why this is so important and why I say requirements are so important is this data set, really, the inputs and outputs like fundamentally define the behavior of the system. So for example here, this is an example of a query that we've had come into a RAG system. And these are two potential responses that you could have. You can imagine standing up this POC. In fact, you don't need to manage it. I'll just show you this later. Stand up this PAC, and you can actually use this POC to actually figure out what is the space of generations that you're going to have. And you have a choice, right? So I don't know if you can see this over here on the left side, but this is an answer. A reasonable answer to this particular question actually gives you some workable code. My voice just changed. Um, hopefully that still works for everyone. But on the right-hand side, we actually have a much more elaborate result, right? And so what we can see is there are actually now additional comments in here. Uh, and in fact, if you look at this isn't the full response, there's actually an entire explanation. The model actually explains all of how this code could work. And so now you, as the application writer, you actually have the choice here to define which are the required behaviors. Do you always need to have comments? Do you always need to have these explanations? These are fundamental design choices that are really in your control and in your stakeholder's control and can only be defined by you. And fundamentally, this is where we see the evaluation set defining the behaviors. Which of these do you prefer for your system to generate? Now, that's the first part for the evaluation set. With the evaluation set in place, I'm going to loop back up and talk about defining and measuring quality. And so here, there are actually, you know, if we look back at that big diagram that we had, I won't go back to it, but every single, or many of the components in that diagram, you could attach some particular type of metric associated with it. For example, with the data, how complete is your data? How well does it actually capture your scenario? The intent of a RAG system is to be able to retrieve relevant documents for the particular task at hand. If you have no relevant documents, then the quality of that particular corpus, that data that you have is probably not up to snuff. There are also elements in the RAG chain. We can think about retrieval quality, and I'll talk about that in more detail. Also think about response quality from the overall system. And then, of course, traditional system performance metrics like latency and cost come into play and need to be captured here as well. Um, for this talk, I'm going to talk primarily about retrieval and response, but I refer you to our generative AI cookbook that gives a much more comprehensive understanding of all of these um, as they actually play in our recommendations and even how you can leverage many of these or lever leverage um, agent evaluation to actually explore and define these metrics for yourself. Now for retrieval quality, there are three terms that I really want to deal with here uh, and explain to give you some underpinnings of how we think about quality and how you should think about quality in the, in, in the RAG setting. And something I want to note here is that while RAG is new, retrieval, the idea of retrieving all relevant information is actually very old. And so these definitions you can actually trace back in the literature back to the 50s when there, some of these first definitions were put into place. Now, what do they mean? Well, first up, let's talk about relevance. Right? Relevance is really the core building block that we're going to have uh, inside of defining these retrieval metrics. So relevance, in particular, we want to be able to define for a given query and a given document, is this document relevant to this query? And so, for example, here's an example here that I've actually pulled. This is coming from an academic paper called Hotpot QA. Um, and HotPot QA is a great way, simple answers, drawn from Wikipedia, a way to explore the behaviors of some systems in a simplified setting. And so here there's this question, which board game was published most recently, Pirates Cove or Catan? And if you actually look at these, those two on the left are very relevant. These are, in fact, the documents that you need. You need those two documents in context to be able to correctly and groundedly, which I'll talk about, actually answer this question in the sense that those are the two documents, those are the two snippets you need to be able to get the right answer here. All right. And we'll get to that answer later. But on the right-hand side, we've got two other ones. The top here, this is talking about Scrabble. Well, that's irrelevant. So that's an irrelevant document. Doesn't really, that's the opposite of our relevance metric. And then here, relevance, you know, it's not necessarily a binary judgment, or not necessarily binary, but it may actually be some subtlety that needs to be sussed out as you think about it. Because for example, here, this document that we have at the bottom right defines or discusses Settlers of Catan, has some interesting information relevant to it, but that information isn't actually specifically relevant for this particular question. So this relevance can be difficult to ascertain and difficult to think through, and we'll talk about later about how we can think about implementing these things in practice. 
Now, given relevance, what we can do is define precision and recall, right? And these are really the aggregate measures that we have for defining the quality of our retrieval. And so precision is first, what is the percentage of retrieved documents that are relevant to a request? So I have a question come in, I have a set of documents that are retrieved, and what I want to know is, what is the fraction of those documents that is relevant over the total number of documents, right? And so ideally, we can use precision to tell how much relevant information are we actually returning, as well as for a given number of retrieved docs, how efficient are we at retrieving that sort of information? Now, the other one that we care about quite a bit as well is recall, which is what is the percentage of required documents that are retrieved? So if you remember back to the slide, what I said is those two documents on the, right, on the left are absolutely required to be able to answer this question, where the answer is actually well-grounded in the context that's been added. And so that means that there are two relevant items for this particular question. And so now when we are looking at a set of documents that have been returned by our retrieval system, we could define recall as the number of relevant retrieved items over the total relevant items. And so now to put that in concretization, we can look at this example here. On the left-hand side, we have all of our relevant documents. This is a little bit extracted. There are four relevant documents for a particular question that we're interested in that is not presented here. Uh, and on this right-hand side in the blue, we've got a set that has been retrieved. So we've retrieved three documents. Now, what we can see is the top two documents in our retrieved documents, those map over to relevant documents. Doc ID 1, Doc ID 7 are both established as relevant over there on the left. Now, what isn't relevant is Doc ID 10. And so now we can use that to think about what our precision and recall is. So precision, we have two documents that are relevant out of our total three. And recall, we got two relevant documents out of the four that we actually need for this particular query. So precision and recall are really the fundamental building blocks that we oftentimes think about in having, of, in measuring the quality of our retrieval system in a rag chain. Now, from retrieval quality, I want to move up to now response quality and think about the variety of different things that we can have in response quality. Particularly, you know, how can we think about the full multidimensional aspect of if our generations are actually good? So one is groundedness. Is the answer supported by evidence in the retrieve context? Define this a little bit more later. One is correctness. Is the answer correct relative to some ground truth answer that's been given? And then additionally, many customers really care about, if they're taking their systems into production, about safety. Is it possible for this to generate harmful content? Uh, and as well, another diagnostic that we have is relevance. Are the answers that we're getting truly relevant to the question at hand? And so on groundness and correctness, I actually wanted to show you an example here of what this can look like. So again, this is our lovely question, which board game was published, or this is, a, this is our lovely question, which board game was published most recently. And we have these two retrieved documents, and these are those same absolute documents that we need. These are the documents that we need to answer this question. So in quiz, that means you got, if this was our full retrieved set of documents, that means we got 100% recall and 100% precision. That was it. So now, let's think about what could happen, right? There's some tight coupling between groundedness and correctness. Um, when we think about it in relation to RAG. So the correct answer to this question is actually Pirate's Code. So if you go through and read that, you're gonna find that Pirate's Code is the answer that we want. And it's grounded in the sense that, yes, Pirate's Code, if we look at our second document, is in fact, after you do the reasoning of pulling together both of these documents together, it is grounded and can be traced to these actual documents. Catan, let's say that our system were actually, instead of put out Catan, that too is grounded, because it's potentially an answer. It's certainly something that could have been put out. However, it's not the correct answer. Right? Now, alternatively, it could have said Scrabble. Nowhere in these documents does it mention Scrabble, so this is not grounded, ungrounded. It's also not correct. Right? Now, there's another corner case here as well, where let's say that we actually lost one of these documents. We actually retrieved only one document. In this instance, and we can see it, let's say that our model actually said Pirate's Cove. How would it do that? Well, perhaps what it's doing is relying on knowledge it's learned from training to generate that answer. And so what that means is, although it's a correct answer, now it's actually not a grounded answer because that document is no longer in context. So groundedness and correctness, as you can see, actually work together and are part of a holistic evaluation if you have uh, a RAG system. And correctness itself is not necessarily clearly defined, right? We already talked about this before, about which answer do you prefer in configuring your correctness and thinking about your correctness, you do need to be careful about subtleties and how we might think about these correctness. Are both of these correct? They are actual both correct answers. 
But there may, in fact, be, when you're thinking about dividing your evaluation sets and your metrics, one that you prefer more than other for your use case. Now, given sort of the subtleties that I've talked about and how these metrics are defined, the way that we actually do this, because it's hard to see how you'd implement this in some deterministic programmable way, but in agent evaluation, what we do is we leverage elements as a judge, which has been a recent research topic, an emerging research topic that has shown that you can actually use LLMs to evaluate LLMs. Doesn't sound very intuitive, and of course, there are caveats, and you need to think about how well these align with the quality of your use case. But overall, you can actually leverage these to get a high quality result by prompting LLMs uh, to actually implement your metrics, such as relevance, corresponding precision, groundness, answer correctness, and more. So to wrap up, I was defining and measuring our quality. Uh, I'm going to leave this over now to Alki to talk about how we improve quality, in particular, how all these things work together inside of agent evaluation uh, to actually improve the overall quality of our systems. Thanks, Mike. All right. So you just heard from Mike about techniques and principles on how to reason, measure, and improve uh, the quality of Gen AI applications. What I'll do now is I'll walk you through a short demo of uh, two products that we announced uh, today, the Mosaic AI Agent Evaluation and Mosaic AI Agent Framework uh, products. Now, these two products were uh, co-developed in close collaboration between research and engineering, um, and they basically enable you to take the techniques and the ideas that Mike presented and use them inside Databricks to develop high-quality uh, Gen AI applications. Now, for the purpose of the demo, I will assume the role of a developer and let's say that I'm building um, a RAG application, which is a Databricks doc pod. This is actually an application that we have internally for our field engineers, so they can basically ask a question about Databricks functionality, and the doc pod will look up information from the publicly available uh, uh, documents that we have on Databricks and synthesize uh, an answer. Now, I will not go into the details of how to actually build this. This is actually part of our cookbook. If you're interested, you can go ahead and, and build this on your own in your account in, in less than an hour. Uh, but we'll be talking most about how can I measure the quality of this uh, bot and how I can improve the quality of this bot using the agent evaluation product. So let me jump now into my uh, environment. All right. So first thing I'm going to do here, I'm going to assume that I just have created the first version of uh, my docbot. Now, don't worry again about the implementation details. All of this is just part of the cookbook. Let's, ju let's just assume that I arrived at some first version of this that just works end to end. Now, I'm interested in improving the quality of this POC because eventually I want to deploy it. And as Mike said, the first thing that I need for quality uh, evaluation is a good evaluation set that contains a representative set of questions that I want to ask the docbot and their expected answers. I could try to come up with a evaluation set on my own, but I'm not the right person to do this. I'm not the subject market, uh, the subject matter expert, right? So what I'll do instead is I will go and ask a few field engineers that I trust, my stakeholders, to test drive the docbot, uh, give me feedback of the bot, and then I'll synthesize the evaluation set. And I can do this very easily by relying on the built-in review app that comes with the Mosaic AI uh, agent evaluation uh, product. So let's see how this works. Uh, the first thing I'll do is I'll write some instructions from our stakeholders, so I'll tell them, hey, this is a doc bot for the fields, please ask questions, give me feedback, I want to cover a bunch of different cases. Next thing is I'll register my model to the unit catalog, and the final step is deploying the review app. And I can do this by calling into this agents.deploy uh, SDK, which is part uh, of the product. And what this will do is we'll bring up a serving endpoint for my app uh, and the app itself. So you can see down here that I get a URL. Um, and this is a URL that I can share with my stakeholders. This is the URL that basically takes me to the built-in uh, UI. So this is what this looks like. Um, Basically, the stakeholders uh, seeing the instructions uh, for what I want them to do, and then they can chat uh, with a bot directly. So let me start to do that. So I can go here and ask a question, what is RAG? And again, this is interacting with my current version of uh, the doc bot. And I get back the answer, but I also have the ability now to provide feedback on the answer. So after looking at this answer, I can say, yes, I like it. It's a good answer. 
I can also look at the documents or the snippets that were retrieved to generate it, and I can provide feedback on them as well. So, you know, I'm looking at this, for instance, and maybe I think that, yeah, this is relevant, I'll say it is, and maybe I'll look at this and say that, you know what, this is less relevant to generate the answers or mark it as such, okay? And I keep going like this, so let me ask one more question. Uh, what is lake house uh, monitoring? And again, same story, I'll get back some answer. Now in this case, I'll sort of simulate the stakeholder who doesn't like the answer, right, and wants to provide some feedback. So um, I can say that uh, this is not a good answer because it was not relevant, and I can even provide a response. So I can say lake house monitoring is a product to monitor data quality. Okay, then save it, and this again becomes part of my feedback uh, as a stakeholder. So as my stakeholders are interacting with the app and uh, providing uh, all this information, all of the requests and their feedback get saved automatically back into tables in the Unity catalog, okay? And now I can go to these tables um, and start analyzing them so that I can curate my evaluation set. So um, here I'm just basically looking at all the requests that came in. So I have uh, some number of requests. I can look at all the assessments that came in uh, again, everything is saved back to the Unity Catalog as a table, and now I can start joining the requests with the assessments to find interesting patterns. So for instance, I can find requests where the stakeholders like the output. And in that case, I can say that whatever my docbot generated can be considered like a good reference answer, right? Because some, some human vetted it. So in this case, there were three cases where this happened, so already I'm feeling nervous about the quality of my docbot. Maybe it's not that good. Uh, conversely, I can also find requests where the stakeholders suggested output, because these are cases where they didn't like the answer, they had a better answer in mind, right? And that better answer for me can serve again as the reference uh, answer to one of these questions. And if you look at the query, it's basically uh, a join between the two tables that are automatically created for me, and I'm just selecting here the cases where there is some suggested output. And I can see here that there are more cases where my stakeholders didn't like the output and suggested their own. So, you know, now I really know that something is up with my docbot. So this is an example of how you can uh, post-process these uh, responses and feedback. Um, now, it's also possible to take some of the responses from one stakeholder and ask another stakeholder to review them. Again, this happens through the same review app that I showed you earlier. But at the end of the day, in this manner, you can start curating an evaluation set based on this uh, feedback from the stakeholders. So let's say that I went through and done it for my case, and now I have an evaluation set which I stored in a table that you see that I synthesized. And in this case, this evaluation set has 10 uh, questions. And basically, what's important here to keep in mind is that this set will have questions that I'm asking the, my docbot and the expected answers that my docbot should give, or something close to that. Okay, so now that I have the evaluation set, I'm ready to measure quality. Now, I could do it manually on my own, right? I could ask every one of these questions to the docbot, look at the answer, compare it to the expected answer, but this will take time. Uh, instead, we will rely on the technique that Mike mentioned, which is basically using LLM judges. And the AI agent uh, evaluation uh, product comes with built-in LLM judges that allow you to quickly measure the quality of your application while you're developing and uh, refining it. So let's see how this works. Um, this is the command to run the evaluation. So this is basically integrated into MLflow. So for some of you, this might look familiar. But basically, um, I want to evaluate a specific version of my model against this evaluation data set that I curated. And the new thing that appears here is that I'm asking the Databricks agent flavor of evaluation to kick in. And this is basically where we'll take every request, pass it through the model to get a response, and then we'll ask our LLM judges to look at the response and assess uh, several quality aspects of it. Now, when this thing finishes, I get a very quick readout of quality. So I see that five out of 10 requests in my evaluation dataset passed the assessment. So it's not great, right? Uh, probably I want to get that up before I decide to launch. 
Uh, but I also get here uh, links that allow me to look at these results in more detail. So let me just click on this first one. And what you'll see here is a detailed view of all the requests that were evaluated. I guess the demo gods might not be on my side today. We'll see. It's taking longer to load. Okay. Um, so anyways, when this thing will come up, we'll basically see that there is a detailed view of all the requests and the metrics that we, the judges that we computed per request. Let's see if I can get maybe a different view here. Sorry, this is not my network here, doesn't want to cooperate. In any case, I'll keep going. Um, actually, I can show you a screenshot because I was worried about this one. Better be prepared, huh? Okay, so what we would see, what would see here uh, is basically, This view. All right, uh, and I'll keep seeing if this thing actually loads up. Still doesn't work. Okay. So um, what you'll see here is on the on the right on the left side. I have all the requests that I'm evaluating, and they're marked as being correct or incorrect. And on the right side, we're seeing basically all the judges that we executed for these requests. So the judges are shown here in this section, and. Um, they correspond to the metrics that Mike described. So we have judges that basically assess how relevant our retrieval is. So in this case, we see that for this particular request, we got five relevant chunks retrieved. We have a judge that looks at the relevance of the query, of the, requ of the response of the uh, request. And in this case, we're seeing that it's actually irrelevant. So this is a little bit alarming. Um, no harmful conduct was detected, the response was grounded, and eventually we're marking the response as uh, incorrect. Now, sorry, I'll just keep, oh, there you go, it loaded, all right. Now I can actually show you uh, in the demo. All right, uh, so let's see. Okay, let me pick this one. So this is basically what you're seeing in the screenshot, but um, we see that the retrieval uh, was correct. And here, if I scroll down, I can see the things that were retrieved and for each one of them, whether the judge uh, marked it as correct or incorrect or relevant or relevant. And I can also see um, a rationale for why that happened. And the rationale here helps me understand how the judge thought about the specific aspect of quality. And it also helps me build some trust about the judge, right, that it's doing the right thing. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we have the judgments for the response up here. And again, for each one of them, I can see the rationales uh, and why the judge thought that it was relevant, unhelpful, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, these judges uh, have been co-developed uh, with research and engineering. Uh, we have our own internal benchmarks that basically try to tune the judges with respect to human agreement. Uh, and this is a uh, work that we keep investing and we keep doing. So over time, our goal is to make these judges uh, even better. Now, you might find some cases where you disagree with the judges. And what you can do is you can go ahead and uh, actually mark your disagreement. So you can say that, look, I don't think actually that, sorry. If I think I need to do this here. Yep. I don't think that is, this is grounded. And then I can provide my rationale. Okay, and then you can take these examples where you disagree with our judges and pass them back to MLflow Evaluate as an extra argument, and then we're gonna use this as future examples when we do the next evaluation, and we'll try to align our judges with your own preferences. So this is a mechanism by which you could make our judges uh, be more aligned with uh, your criteria. Now, because everything is integrated with MLflow, you also get to see the same metrics side by side with your model. So this is the run where I created my model. And here I've logged the same metrics, but in aggregate, right? So I can see that, for instance, uh, in aggregate, 70% of my responses are relevant, but 100% of them are grounded. Uh, the same results are also visible inside the notebook because we return everything as a data frame. 
So what you can do here is you can filter them. So in this case, for instance, I'm looking at all the responses that were marked as grounded, but not relevant, if I want to debug them further. All right. So at this point, I'm ready to iterate to improve quality, okay? And this goes back to what Mike was describing about pulling some lever that will help me get to a better version of my bot. Now, which lever to pull will depend on all of these evaluations and metrics. And if I go back to what uh, I'm seeing here in this particular run, we basically see that, okay, we're 50% accurate, so we definitely want to create more accurate responses. We're also seeing that we're 82 on average, uh, precision is at 82%, which is okay, but you know, it sort of makes me wonder, should it be higher, right? Should I be retrieving more uh, chunks and that are relevant? And if I look at these uh, specific questions, for instance, for this one, I can see that I retrieved relevant chunks, but I can also see that what I'm retrieving here has a lot of links that don't seem to have any relationship to the question that is being asked. Instead, the content for the question appears much later. Okay, and so I'm forming this hypothesis now in my head that maybe what's happening is that I'm retrieving the right documents, but I'm also putting a lot of irrelevant information on those documents. And as it turns out, if I look at the source of the document, uh, which is over here, I'll find out that all those links come from the left side of the documentation where it's just a navigation. So they're completely irrelevant for answering any queries that my users have. Um, and so what I'll do next is I'll go in my bot and change the indexing, the, 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 the retrieval part. I'll rewrite my parser so that it ignores the left side nav of this documentation. I'll also strip that HTML away and I'll chunk again and have a new version of my index. And what I'll do here is I will create a new version of my model and then evaluate it again to see whether it improves things. And lo and hold, in this case, I get eight out of 10 uh, pass, which means that I went from five to eight, and this is great, right? I managed my hypothesis about improving this was correct. I managed to get the results better. And again, as always, I can uh, click on this, and I guess when eventually my network wakes up, we'll be able to see the same view as over here, except that instead of the uh, five incorrect, we're gonna have uh, the, the two incorrect answers, because eight out of 10 passed. There you go, okay? And now I can go back and sort of try to figure out, okay, what are the, what is the root cause for these two incorrect answers? Do one more iteration, try to fix it until I get the pass rate that I, that I want. All right, now, so far I've been uh, presenting examples where we measured uh, metrics only related to our built-in judges. You might have a business criterion that is very domain specific, that is not covered by our judges. And for this case, we basically allow you to define custom judges that are run as part of uh, MLflow Evaluate alongside our own judges. So in this case, in this example, I'll define a custom judge that assesses professional tone, right? Because I'm addressing a technical audience. And the way I'll do that is, first of all, I'll pick an endpoint. And you'll notice that I didn't have to do that for the built-in judges, because for the built-in judges, we provision the endpoints and we optimize the prompts for those endpoints on our side, so you don't have to worry about that. For the custom judges, you have to pick the endpoint and you have to write the prompt. In this case, I'm going for a very simple prompt. You know, usually you would do some prompt engineering around this. Um, but you, what you see in the prompt is that I'm leaving some variables and the idea is that these variables will be filled in. Our framework will call your judge, get back the results and incorporate them. And then I can just write MLflow evaluate, or I can run MLflow evaluate and just pass the extra judge down here. And what will happen, um, and let me just you know, kick this open because apparently it takes some time to load. But what will happen here is that you'll see that at the top section where we had our judges, we'll have the professional judge uh, as an additional pill. This is the custom judge that I just defined. And again, I'll be able to read its rationale and sort of you know, convince myself that it is doing the right thing. I agree with it and so on and so forth. All right, so we're coming close to the end. The last thing that I want to mention here is how do you go from uh, having an experiment uh, or a, a version that you like enough to put in production? How do you put it in production? Again, the agent framework that we launched today allows you to do that very easily. It's the same deploy method that will take whatever version you're happy with and put it in production behind an endpoint, a REST API essentially. 
And you can then use lakehouse monitoring to start monitoring the requests that are coming in your endpoints to make sure that things are still working well uh, in production in the wild as your users are asking about them. So what I have here is a dashboard that I got through uh, lakehouse monitoring on top of the tables that we create automatically for you for these endpoints. And here I'm tracking the negative reactions from users in my system. And basically you can see that recently my users started providing negative feedback uh, to, to the requests, to the response from the bot. So basically this is something that I need to fix. But again, because everything is logged automatically back into the UC, back into tables, I can go to these tables and say, show me all the requests that got a negative feedback. I can take these requests, put them back in the review app, ask my stakeholders to look at them, and then take those results and put them back into my evaluation set. So now I have a bigger evaluation set, more informed with what's happening in production, and then I can go ahead and do the uh, next iteration over my application. Okay, so we are very close to the end. So I'll just flash the slide. So everything that I talked about today is in public review. Um, basically, the goal is to enable you to build high-quality applications inside Databricks. Um, we hope that uh, you'll try it and uh, tell us how it works for your use cases. Thank you.